Hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor today to talk about the 2025 ESC EA CTS guidelines on bubble heart disease with the two chairmen of the task force, Professor Fabian Pra from uh, University of Bern and uh, Professor Michael Borger, Director of Cardiac Surgery at Leibniz Art Center. So thank you so much, Fabian and Michael, for joining us uh, for this talk. So I will uh, directly start uh, with uh, this uh, card that uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it is uh, 28 new recommendations and uh, 50 review uh, revised recommendations for these new guidelines. So it's something very important. A huge work uh, has been done. And uh, in this, the diagnostic flow has a particular uh, emphasis. So uh, Fabian, imaging is central in the diagnostic work in the new guidelines, especially the CT, the multimodality imaging. So how much do you think uh, this will reshape the daily practice uh, and the acting discussion? So yeah, absolutely, uh, Alex, you have seen that we have put a lot of emphasis on, on imaging uh, for valvular heart disease. And actually, we have tried also to provide with new figures, an overview of the severity criteria, uh, but also, you know, of the criteria used for, uh, for the uh, decision making for an intervention. And also, we try to show a little bit what are the different mechanisms of the disease based on, on imaging. And of course, echocardiography is in the center, absolutely, of the diagnostic and decision making making for valvular heart disease, but there is more and more emphasis on the use of CT scan for planning of procedures uh, because of the resolution, but also for looking at coronary artery disease. And that's what we actually now recommend in our guideline, the use of more and more CT to look at the coronary, in particular in patients with a lower risk of coronary artery disease, younger patients, but also to use the information that you get during uh, planning CT for TAVI, for example, to uh, exclude coronary artery disease. And potentially in this patient, other invasive uh, examination like coronary angiography are not needed. And the second point I just would like to mention is the use of uh, cutoff criteria for aortic regurgitation based on CMR as well, which is a very new uh, recommendation and, and encourage people to use multimodality imaging. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, getting more in the deep, coming uh, to the uh, to the valves, uh, about the aortic valve, Michael, why was uh, the, the, the question that everybody is asking, why the cutoff of 70 years old for the aortic stenosis treatment? Oh, well, there's been... And, um, and I can see it. Yeah. Please, please. There's been, been much more um, data published on low-risk TAVI versus SAVR trials since the last version of the guidelines, which were published in 2021. And uh, each of these trials included patients between the ages of 70 and 75, 75 being the old cutoff, and cumulative, cumulatively between these studies, especially with the addition of the large um, dedicate study from uh, Germany, we felt that there was enough data to um, support clearly that TAVI is a very safe uh, procedure in patients over 70 and at least up to five years, uh, very effective. And uh, we need, of course, more time and more follow-up, but um, we felt quite comfortable as a uh, task force that um, in light of the new evidence that lowering the threshold to 70 was a reasonable decision and also reflected clinical practice in most uh, developed countries around the world. Absolutely. And uh, what about the lifetime management in this guideline? Yeah, lifetime management would be optimally the thing that, uh, sorry, lifetime management is based mostly on life expectancy. And optimally, that would be calculated for each individual patient, but it's very difficult to calculate. Uh, in some European countries, the data is not accessible and it can vary even from region to region within countries very complex and therefore we wanted to give clinicians sort of a very practical uh, way to estimate uh, their lifetime, uh, sorry, their life expectancy and that is uh, with their age. And uh, the life expectancy is one of many factors for lifetime management, including the durability of the procedure, what the future options are, 
And uh, this is extensively discussed in the guidelines for aortic valve disease and a little bit also for mitral valve disease. Absolutely. Uh, the AF team is definitely the best place to discuss about all the uh, features of the patient. And uh, going on uh, through the mitral valve, uh, Fabian, the most important probably uh, the new of these guidelines is the distinction between atrial and uh, ventricular SMR. How do you see these uh, change in prognosis and uh, therapeutic strategies in the future? So yes, you know, I think that we, are, we are closing a gap there uh, in, in, in previous guidelines, but also in studies that have been done in the, in the mitral field, because this population of patients obviously are, are very different, but in the past they were both called uh, secondary mitral regurgitation. But we have to deal on one side to the, with the dilatation of the left atrium in uh, most of the patients with chronic uh, atrial fibrillation, which is the main mechanism for mitral regurgitation in atrial secondary mitral regurgitation. And these patients have also a normal left ventricular injection uh, fraction. And then on the other side, you know, you have the heart failure patient with reduced ejection fraction, uh, a diseased ventricle and tethering of the leaflet of the mitral valve as a cause of mitral regurgitation. So these two populations are completely different. Um, and that's the pr first time we provide a definition a very clear definition that is not only based on echo, but also on clinical criteria uh, to be able uh, to make the, the distinctions. And the reason for that is that uh, because management of this patient are, are very, uh, very different. And on one side, we have a new recommendation for ventricular secondary mitral regurgitation or an updated recommendation uh, for uh, edge to edge repair. Uh, that has been shown in three studies um, and a meta-analysis uh, to have favorable results uh, compared to, to medical treatment in patients with heart failure and associated mitral regurgitation. And we also have a recommendation on the management of uh, atrial secondary mitral regurgitation, where surgery plays a very important role because these patients have an intact left ventricular function and edge to edge repair can also be used in high-risk patients. Yes, and uh, on the other side, we have the tricuspid bulb and tricuspid intervention uh, are evolving quickly. So, Michael, after uh, the recent uh, trials, uh, can we already say the goal is more uh, than uh, just a quality of life improvement or uh, we need more and more data about it? We definitely need more data. The um, quality of life seems to be the strongest effect from transcatheter interventions on the tricuspid valve, but also right ventricular reverse remodeling has been demonstrated. And um, this, what we also try to sort of uh, bring across and stress more and more through um, throughout the document, um, not just for tricuspid regurgitation patients, but also for mitral regurgitation and for a a aortic stenosis, is that we want to encourage clinicians to intervene earlier in the disease process before, for example, for TR, before they develop severe RV dysfunction uh, or severe, um, uh, or if they have severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so we want to intervene at an earlier stage when the patients can benefit the most from it. But uh, transcatheter is obviously not the only option. Uh, surgery, there are uh, clear indications uh, for surgery, especially in those patients that are under, undergoing left-sided heart valve surgery, and we've refined those uh, recommendations for simultaneous tricuspid valve surgery. But there's also a role for uh, low-risk patients that occasionally present with isolated TR uh, for surgery. It can also be a very effective therapy. Yes. Uh, what you are highlight, the simultaneous repair of both uh, left-side valves and tricuspid valve is something that, uh, at least in Italy, is not so... Uh, so in the practice, uh, um, so present in the practice. So it, definitely we hope that these guidelines will uh, help uh, a lot to introduce this concept. And uh, another very important uh, uh, chapter of these guidelines is the antithrombotics. Uh, Fabian, the simplification of the antithrombotic strategies uh, is one of the most important practice changing of uh, all these guidelines. How do you expect these uh, affect the real-world management. We will see more trials about it. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess you know what we try to do there is is really to to bring this to uh, practitioners uh, to have uh, a clear message how to manage anticoagulation after uh, valve implantation. Make, making the difference between mechanical and uh, and biological valve, of course, after TAVI as well. And then to have also clear strategy uh, how to stop and restart uh, oral anticoagulation uh, in the patient undergoing a surgical procedure. And there is a completely revisited uh, guidance uh, regarding this that we hope is clear and, and, and provide help also for non-specialized uh, physicians. And briefly, you know, what, what is maybe important is uh, the, the increasing role of DOAC uh, that can be used according to our recommendation in patients who have uh, a previous indication, basically atrial fibrillation and receive a biological valve. Uh, in that situation, the continuation of DOAC uh, is um, as a corresponding recommendation in, in our guideline. And I think that uh, simplifies a lot. Uh, the, the management. And then we have also opened the door for um, uh, having no bridging in patients with aortic mechanical valve. Also a very new recommendation. Of course, if these valves are of the latest generation and uh, the patient uh, undergo a procedure with a short period of, uh, of uh, interruption of the oral anticoagulation, that's also something uh, that is very useful, I think, to, to, to the clinicians. Absolutely. And uh, Michael, uh, to close our, inter our interview, we saw that one of the pillars of the guidelines is uh, the recognition of the art valve center. And uh, we have to pay attention at the volume of the center. There are center of excellence, center where a uh, complex procedure can be performed. Uh, should this be in the end of the scientific societies, of the industry? How we can manage this difference for the best of the patients? Well, it was very clear to the members of the task force that there is an association between outcomes and volumes. It's just the more you do something that's technically demanding, the better you get at it. Um, this is common sense in not only in medicine, but in any uh, type of activities that we perform at a high level as human beings. But uh, it was tr difficult to sort of define exactly what high volume was because it varies from country to country and region to region. And therefore, we ended up on a sort of a general um, uh, text. Um, but we did get specific on those uh, procedures, especially the surgical and transcatheter procedures that are particularly complex, where we, we feel strongly that those patients should be referred to high volume centers. But I would also like to say the patient representatives played a huge role throughout the document, but especially in this area. And, and we asked them, we said, you know, because there's, there's always people that want to argue against patient volume uh, outcomes. Um, and uh, we asked them what their thoughts on this were, and they both very strongly said, we have to make a statement on this. Uh, maybe not as strong as some of us would have liked to have seen, but uh, certainly we wanted to think uh, of the patient's uh, best interests at all times. Totally agree. And uh, I think we will uh, see uh, more studies, more data about, uh, about also this topic uh, in the future. Uh, the work of the task force uh, you led uh, was uh, amazing. Uh, everybody in the field uh, really appreciate uh, your amazing work. And so thank you so much for your generous uh, sharing uh, today. Thank you so much for your leadership. And uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, following us. And we will see you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Asano. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. See you soon. Thank you.